from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And from Jeremiah, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name. We are safe only to go on doing these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching you, says the Lord. And from the Gospel of Luke. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their clo cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen. They were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation with God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So when hundreds of thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. yesterday, joined by hundreds of thousands more from around the world as part of the March for Our Lives rally, I couldn't help but uh, remember a story about two people, two men who were put before a firing squad. And the commandant comes forward to ask them for any last request. And the first guy spits in the commandant's face, provoking the second guy to rebuke the first, saying, for heaven's sakes, Ferdinand, don't make trouble. <laughs> There's something about having a, a gun pointed in your face that makes you realize you have nothing to lose and maybe it's time to act up a bit. That uh, yesterday's march was perhaps a, a most fitting context for Palm Sunday, actually, because it was on Palm Sunday and through Holy Week that Jesus is acting from a sense that he has a gun at his head. If you look at a map of, Israel, uh, of Jesus' travels around uh, Palestine uh, as he pr preached and taught and healed, you discover one thing, that he was 
following a path that was always kind of on the edge of administrative districts. So he could kind of kick up dust in one and then cross over the border to the next administrative district where the other authorities had no power. And the reason he did this is because Herod has been after Jesus for a long time. Herod wants to do to Jesus what he did to John the Baptist, dispatch with it. And so Jesus is always kind of doing this little dance, but Jesus is wise enough to know that you can't play this game of cat and mouse forever. That if he's taken out in some side town, um, would we be here today? I mean, his message would be, you know, great preaching and so forth, but we would never have heard of Jesus again. So he knew he couldn't keep this up, so he decides to go out with a bang. He's going to die, so he's going to make it a big, dramatic death. And so we have been studying Jesus' life and teachings and parables through art this, during uh, Lent, uh, looking at the way, many ways his life and teachings were depicted. Well, this morning is time to turn to the drama that Jesus himself carefully crafted, which began on Palm Sunday. Now, evidence that, and you may want to ask yourself then, what message was it that Jesus felt so, was so important that he would make such a dramatic statement such that nobody could unsee the statement again? What was the message that was so critical to Jesus? But evidence that he was carefully scripting this drama starts just before Palm Sunday even begins. Did you notice? Jesus actually stops two towns before, before Jerusalem. He does not go further further because Herod's spies are everywhere. And once Jesus sets his plan in motion, he's got to move quickly. He can't just be searching around the the town before Jerusalem looking for the donkey. He's already made arrangements. He's already talked to somebody or or his disciples. So he gives instructions to send his disciples ahead, find the donkey at the guy's house. And if you're untying him and the guy notices, ask what you're doing with it, Don't say, Jesus has need for it. I mean, Herod's ears are everywhere. Say, the Lord has need for it, and he'll know exactly what you're doing. So they procure this donkey, and Jesus gets on it in the Mount of Olives just before all hell breaks loose. (laughs) But first, not without a little celebration. Uh, Why is Jesus on a donkey? Every single God-fearing Jew in Jerusalem would have seen what he's, what he's trying to do. They knew the scriptures as well as Jesus. Well, at least maybe partly as well as Jesus. But they knew this one. They knew this one the, from the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt the fall of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow bow will be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. Now, everybody got this. That crowd that, that they'd already made arrangements for, I mean, do you ever make a huge crowd without sending out word quietly and doing some organizing. He's met by this huge crowd on the Mount of Olives. He's sitting on the donkey, and what happens? It's, the scriptures tell us the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully, right on cue, with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to him, Hey, wait a minute. Teacher, tell your disciples to stop. Do you know what the hell is going to break loose? If all this crowd is, 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 is calling you king? Now, of all times of year, when Jerusalem is on high alert, the Roman guard is everywhere because during the Passover celebration, sometimes people get a bit feisty, sometimes there's riots, they're all there, and you're you're causing a ruckus, making a bid for kingship? Tell your disciples to stop! And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would shout. Oh, yeah. (laughs) They're aware that the emperor is not going to take uh, 
kindly to such words. The Romans never do. Never do. He is making his bid to replace the emperor for the Jews. The one, the, uh, Caesar Augustus, whose very title is king, whose very title is savior of the world, whose very title includes prince of peace, whose very title includes son of God. Jesus is putting him place, himself in the place of the emperor. No way. Interesting that the very, so he's, he's already, he's kicked the hornet's nest with respect to the political establishment. I mean, the word's going to get out, and, <laughs> and everybody's on nerve. So the very, it's interesting that the very first thing he does when he enters Jerusalem is he kicks another hornet's nest. That is the hornet's nest of the entire religious establishment. If he hadn't done it enough already on the Mount of Olives, he goes directly into the temple, and he, he topples the tables, shouting, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Again, this is all very carefully scripted. This is Jesus' chance to die big. <laughs> now, any, we tend to think, look at this passage and we think, well, Jesus was protesting, uh, holding bake sales in churches and fundraisers and you know, that kind of thing. They're trying to make money in a, in a house of worship. Well, you know, I'll give you that, but... Any, again, any God-fearing Jew in Jerusalem would have understood the reference, den of robbers. They know exactly where that came from. It comes from the prophet Jeremiah. Six centuries earlier, Jeremiah had stood in the temple and proclaimed this, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are safe, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You see, if Jesus had just come to the temple and preached a, a sermon about everything he thought was important, like I do every Sunday, everybody would have forgotten it, right? Jesus has to make a dramatic statement that cannot be unseen and unheard, and he puts the seed of the larger message. He names den of robbers so people would know this is about a lot more than charging some money for a few offerings in the temple. Basically, what Jesus is saying to the entire religious establishment, the elite of Jerusalem, is your religion is so fundamentally corrupt that you may as well be worshiping Baal because you're certainly not worshiping the God of Moses, of Abraham. You may as well be worshiping Baal. If you want to get a sense of what that what it felt like in Jesus' day, that gut punch, that hornet's nest kick, uh, imagine Jesus coming back today and confronting the religious leaders who tend to get, make the headlines, the ones that, that get on the CNN and all that, to whom all the, the nation turns when they're listening for a word of the Lord. I mean, did you see this photograph uh, last week? Uh, in the wake of the shootings in Florida, there was actually a church that, that held a wedding dedication service for 250 wedding dedicators wearing crowns of bullets and bringing with them AR-15 rifles in a ceremony that had actually been planned before the shooting? Talk about a message that's become so fundamentally corrupt that <laughs> goes well beyond affirming a simple right to bear arms. It's some strange netherworld that, that certainly Jesus never would have conceived of. Now, you can argue, well, the, if you know about this story, um, that was the, the Sun Young Moods movement. That was not a regular Christian church. That was that cult which some people call the Moonies. They were the ones who did that. But that just reinforces the point. Would Jesus, if he would have come today, would probably look at those very religious leaders in our country saying, your message has been so, become so fundamentally corrupt that you are sowing seeds of violence that you can't even imagine. You're so corrupt now that you may as well be a Mooney. You may as well be, call yourself a cult. A cult that worships Mars, 
the Roman god of war. That might stand a few people up. There's his message. Interestingly enough, the very first words out of his mouth, when, he, you know, when people declared Jesus king, as he's coming down the Mount of Olives, he stops above Jerusalem. You hear it, and he says, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. So that's the first message in this huge drama that Jesus starts on Palm Sunday. If you, even you, would have only recognized what makes the things that make peace for peace. He starts with that message, we go through Holy Week, and he ends with what? The same message, but now told in a way that cannot be unseen. Told in a way that cannot be unheard. He ends his message on a cross before and allowing himself to be killed rather than to kill another on a cross. And the world has been trying to snuff out the message that he's telling on that cross ever since including the Christian community. The Christian community, so many Christians have taken that message to say basically the opposite of what Jesus' message was, to say, yeah, we've got the blood of Jesus on us, that Passover lamb. He, he deliberately made, swapped his own body as the Passover sacrifice on the pa day of Passover. It means that if you believe in the blood of Jesus, you get into heaven and everybody else burns in hell. That's the message you see how far we are from the essence of the faith of Jesus? By putting himself in place of the Passover lamb in this great drama that Jesus has enacted, again, any good God-fearing Jew of his day would have seen the clear message. That Passover, the original one, remember about the Jews who put, paint the blood on the lintels and the doorposts so that the Spirit of God would pass over them in Egypt and slay the guilty oppressors, the Egyptian oppressors. Jesus is turning that whole Passover on its head by allowing himself to be the lamb that the guilty oppressors slay and the blood to flow from him that means that there is a new Passover, passing over not just the Jews, but everyone, everyone including the Romans themselves. That Jesus' message is a one of truly of peace. That if you're going to be a child of God, a follower of God, you stand for peace, not violence. You stand for waging peace, not simply accepting peace. Because you have to wage peace in a violent world. You can't just simply say, I'll take that when it comes along. You know, that, that whole love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who, who mistreat you. It, the whole cross brings together in stark relief that exact message that Jesus has been preaching and preaching and teaching and embodying all over the country throughout his entire ministry. And we, for 2,000 years, have been trying to squelch out that message. Oh, we give lip service to it. We say, oh, isn't that nice? Yes, we need to love our enemies until our enemies hurt us. We say, oh, that's really nice. When the pressure gets high, we say, that's, those are nice words, but Jesus is naive. We can't just roll over when enemies come. But what is it in this divine drama that Jesus is embodying that suggests he's rolling over? He's saying, you can kick the hornet's nest when you're fighting for peace. Just don't take a human life. Do it nonviolently. But you can kick the hornet's nest. You can rattle the cages. You can... You can alert the networks, you can agitate, you can disrupt, but do it non-violently so that the main message that you're trying to come across is clear, that God loves everyone, that God's love extends to everyone, including the very hornets whose nest you're kicking.
As Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave you with it leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there and he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they had heard. If you, even you, had only recognized the things that make for peace. And he goes on with all those, that, that horrible um, image. You know, Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you, will surround you and hem you in from every side. They'll crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Christians have taken this in, in their absence from the connection with that, that peace message of Jesus have projected this, made this an apocalyptic remark by Jesus in their interpretation, predicting a second coming that would happen thousands of years beyond him in which the righteous get their reward and the unrighteous get what's coming to them. <laughs> no, Jesus is not concerned with his second coming in this passage. He's concerned with his first coming, and he's not thinking about things that will happen thousands of years after he's gone. He's thinking of something that will happen a little less than 40 years after he's gone. He's no dummy. He sees the signs of the time. He sees in the temple leadership that their own uh, division of righteous and unrighteous, uh, their own we-them thing that, makes the, 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 that turns people into the elect, the chosen, the ones loved by God, and the unelect, the unchosen, the ones hated by God, that this will sow the seeds of violence that will lead ultimately to Israel's uh, violence coming upon Israel. Already in his day, there are this group called the Zealots that are advocating a military resistance to Rome to take on the empire using arms. And these people are starting to be heard by the religious establishment and affirmed. It does not take too much intelligence. It does not take being the divine, a divine person or son of God or savior of the world to see where this could lead. Just as today, it does not take too much intelligence to see where things are headed in our world if things do not change in a pretty fundamental way. Jesus is seeing here what will happen about 37 years after his death, which is the fall of Jerusalem. When the Zealot Party had grown and grown, people advocating for violence had grown and grown, joined by a second group called the Sicarii, who were also even more zealous Jews who were actively killing not Romans, but Jews who disagreed with the message of violent overthrow, calling them traitors and killing them. That message grew and grew, and finally the Jews started open revolt, which lasted for four years, and finally the Roman government said, enough, we're putting an end to this, and they surely did. If you read the writings of Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, it will raise the hair on the back of your neck as he describes what happened the day of the fall of Jerusalem, the amazing blood running down from the altar that was human blood, not lamb's blood, during, by the way, a Passover celebration, the pa during Passover week. Once no, that destruction was so great that you could actually, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can see where the walls came down to this day. There's only one wall remaining from that original Jerusalem. It's called the Wailing Wall. 
And for 2,000 years, people have been wailing over what happened in 70 CE. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people have celebrated Tish B'Av, which is the memorial of Jerusalem. And all this came about not because they didn't recognize Jesus as, as the true Messiah, because they did not recognize the message that was embodied in their own faith to which Jesus was trying to get them to return, which is what? <laughs> Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those abuse, who abuse you. Bless those who persecute you. Now this is the, uh, if you go to Rome, you'll see this, the Arch of Titus, who was the general who sacked Jerusalem and then became, got promoted to be emperor of Rome after that. He did such a good job. And so you'll see the Arch of Titus in which uh, the Roman soldiers are depicted as hauling away the very, impl the, the very most sacred objects from the temple. And you'll also see, if you have a chance, the Temple of Peace set up in honor of Emperor Titus. That's a depiction of part of it, where he actually took those sacred objects from the temple that he had destroyed and put them in the Temple of Peace. In other words... You want peace, I'll make peace. Here's how the Romans make peace. We destroy and crush the violence with greater violence. We crush force with greater force. That's Pax Romana. But Jesus makes this dramatic message in Jerusalem to teach us a message that cannot be untaught, which it's given, to show us things that cannot be unseen, to give us a message that cannot be unheard. And part of it has to do with us sitting here today, and part of it had to do with those sitting there in their day, walking a path that was going to lead straight to their destruction. And it's as if he's holding out a sign. He said, you can either follow the Pax Romana, or you can follow my path to peace. In which you love your enemies. You love your enemies, even when they are your enemies. You do good to those, even when they hate you. You bless people, even those who curse you. You pray for those people, even those who mistreat you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Sing aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, cries the prophet Zechariah. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. If we were to update Zechariah's language, we might say, he will cut off the AR-15s from schools, and the fighter jets from all nations, and the nuclear weapons shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. We can either celebrate Palm Sunday by vowing once again to be instruments of Christ's peace in the world, to wage peace rather than merely accept it. We can celebrate this way or we can wave palms and eat pancakes. But surely this meal brings together this most dramatic message. My friends, my enemies, this is my very body which I break for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. Vow to be an instrument of my peace every time you eat a meal. Friends, this is my blood which is shed for you. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Don't passively resist violence. Actively resist violence. Vow to do this every time you drink of a cup. For by eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we bring into our own body and blood the very instruments of peace that Jesus talks about. Truly meeting force 
with a power that is greater than force. A power that, they, that all force has been trying to snuff out from human existence since it was very, the very beginning, that force being love. The gifts of God for the people of God. I invite our servers to prepare the feast. And as they come forward, I invite you to join me in re remembering who we are and whose we are. We are an inclusive, open, and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We care for one another. <laughs> we care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. You do not have to be a member of Countryside Church to participate in this ritual. All that we ask is if your heart calls you forward, come, knowing you are most welcome here. So likewise, if you'd prefer to receive communion from your seat, uh, simply raise your hand as an usher passes.